Hello and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is career coach extraordinaire, Lorraine Rise. She's the CEO and founder of Career Uprising, a career coaching firm that supports clients all over the world and in every major industry. Lorraine, it is a pleasure to have you today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. You have a fascinating backstory. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you started Career Uprising. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, you know, I'm kind of an accidental business owner. It was not something that I had any intention of doing. In fact, I actively resisted the idea of being an entrepreneur for years, even though it was whispering in my ear many, many times. For years, I resisted it for a lot of reasons. I, to be honest, I, I didn't really think that I was that type. I didn't think that I was, um, you know, smart enough or savvy enough or whatever. I just never really identified when I was in my twenties with um, owning a business. It just sounded hard, right? It didn't sound like something I wanted to was able to do. Mm -hmm. But it's funny how um, life just kind of threw me <laughs> in that direction. Um, so I started out uh, just wanting to get into the corporate world and have a nine to five job and get out of retail when I was in my 20s. And that was my immediate goal. And, um, and I did that. And I worked in the corporate world and I was in HR and I was a manager and I kind of checked that box, right, of, of what I thought I wanted when I graduated and I did that for a number of years and, and it was good. I honestly, I was happy for a little while. I liked being a trainer and a manager and hiring employees and uh, I was doing sales. I was doing things that played to my strengths, but um, I don't know, after about five, six years of that, I just kind of reached a point where I thought, wow, this isn't really satisfying me as much anymore. I have the schedule, I have an office, I have all these, it was all these surface level things that I said sure. that I wanted, right? Sure. Um, which I think is kind of how you think in your 20s, <laughs> okay. right? I just wanted like an office and I wanted to work nine to five, Monday through Friday and right. all these things. And I got that and then I did that for a while. And then I realized I wanted really meaningful work. I wanted to do something that made a difference. I wanted to take it to the next level. And um, so the idea of coaching people and starting a business started to whisper in my ear, but I didn't have any real motivation to rock the boat at that point. I, I was okay in my work and everything, um, but I did go through a period of multiple separations and layoffs in my 20s, just job searching all the time, no fault of my own really, just circumstance. It happened one after the other, Lay out, you know, buyouts and acquisitions and things like that. Of course. And um, funny, I realize all of that now is shaping my work as a career coach, right? All those experiences that I had were preparing me for the work that I was going to be doing. So, um, but anyway, in, in 2015, I had an unforgettable experience being at a kind of the proverbial toxic job for the first time in my life. I was completely mismatched for the culture at this company. Uh, it was just not right at all. I didn't fit in working at a little teeny startup with just a few employees. And I think they didn't know what they needed in the position that they hired me for. It was, everything was very ambiguous. And it ended with me being abruptly fired, which was absolutely okay because I started my business. Wow. That was the motivation I needed, right? So I had the inspiration, but I didn't have a reason to make a bold move. There was nothing urgent happening, right? So we sometimes don't act on things until there's a crisis, right? Or until there's a reason to really take a bold action. Yeah. And so I got that reason in 2015. And, um, and here I am. <laughs> wow. So I start, I said, after that experience, I said, I'm working for myself. I'm going to make this for myself. I'm going to coach people who have gone through what I have gone through or to help people avoid what I have gone through, to help people find the right job, not do what I did and just take the first offer that comes along and it's terrible. And mm. so that's what I do. So, so that's the short story. <laughs> that's the, the, the cliff notes version of the last, you know, 10 years of my life. But um, here I am. It's been five years since I started career uprising. And, um, 
and it's awesome. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And I, yeah. So it's, it's funny how I'm the perfect example of how all the, the things that you go through in your life prepare you for where you're going to be. I think that's true for all of us, right? Yeah. We just don't see it at the time. So. Right, right. Well, <laughs> and, and, and congratulations are in order because you've been getting a lot of really good press lately. Oh, thank you. <laughs> especially in the time that we're in now, especially with uh, with COVID-19, the economic shutdowns, the epic and, and unprecedented unemployment that we're, we've seen, uh, or at least that we've seen by percentage, you know, since the Great Depression. Um, and, and you've been getting a lot of really good press about what you've been saying about essential jobs. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious, and I'm sure other people are curious as well, should people start orienting themselves toward essential jobs? Mm hmm yeah, I think somewhat. So, so here's the thing. I'm never an advocate of somebody taking a job that they're not a fit for, which is kind of what I just said, right? Like I've been through that, right? right. So I think there always needs to be thought and intention into your next move. And it, it needs to fit your skills. It needs to fit your priorities, and maybe some people's priorities are shifting right now. They might be, right? Mm -hmm, a lot of right. people, I think, are shifting their priorities to short term, to their kind of in survival mode right now. So um, it might make sense for some people to, to take what's kind of considered an essential job right now. But um, in the long run, I would want people to think about, yes, is, is this a uh, you know, a, an industry that's going to grow and be around. That's always a good consideration, right. but you have to give equal con consideration to, can I really do this job? Is it really a match for my aptitude and my, my skills? Or maybe I need to just change to change my skills. Maybe I need to get some training or certification so I can better fit this. So mm -hmm. I don't, I, I kind of take a balanced approach. Yes. It's yeah. a good idea to be aware of what is an essential job or what is a job that's going to grow and be around um, in a post-pandemic world. But yeah. I want people to give equal consideration to what are they going to be able to stay in, right? We don't want to try not to make too many short-term moves that just kind of add up to, to where am I going? <laughs> yeah. We have to balance the short and the long term, I guess, is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So it may make sense to some people and other people. Yeah. 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 What percentage of your customers are victims of COVID-19 versus those that are looking to change jobs and careers mm. as a natural course of their career? Yeah, it, it, it's funny. I, it, it's kind of a mix. It, it's a little bit of a 50-50 mix. I would say I've definitely in, wow. in March and April when, when all of this first started, I saw a huge influx of business, but interestingly, it wasn't people who were laid off necessarily or had lost their jobs. It was more people who were just taking this time to make that long-term career change, right? Mm -hmm. to, to do what they had always wanted to do, always wanted to get into this field. So now they're doing that. They're kind of changing their skills and reevaluating their path. I think a lot of people are taking this time now to reevaluate things, whether they have to or just want to. Right. So right. I've seen a lot of that, but I will say the biggest change and the biggest trend that I have seen, and this has been really fascinating for me to see is my demographic is normally mid and late career professionals pretty exclusively. I work with people who are 40, 50, 60 plus, and that's been the case for mo pretty much the whole five years that I've been doing coaching, but that has completely changed. Mm. I have seen an absolute influx of millennials and young grads reaching out for help. Yes. And it's been astounding to me to see a complete flop of my client base wow. right now. I don't market myself to young folks. I actively market myself to mid and late career professionals. That is my client base. Mm -hmm. But I have seen a string of young folks whose parents are stepping in and helping and paying <laughs> for my services wow. to help this new grad get a job because, wow. and which I think is fascinating because I didn't do anything to make that demographics, which happen. <laughs> it just <laughs> happened. This is just who was coming my way. Right. 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 It's, so I'm serving who's coming my way yeah. and I'm kind of pivoting, but I'm, I'm thinking, wow, this makes a lot of sense because I can see why the parents would be really um, concerned because they have this young you know, new grad who's now done with school, supposed to be moving out on their own, supposed to be finding an apartment. And 
and moving out of the house, right? Their parents' house and might not be able to do that. If they can't get a job, they're going back home. And I, right. a lot of people are moving. Young folks are graduating college and moving right back home because yeah. they don't have a job offer or they had a job offer. And some of them are getting them rescinded as well because the job's no longer there. Yeah. So yeah. that makes a lot of sense to me. I can see how parents would be, A, just concerned for their kid and wanting to see them be successful and maybe also not wanting them to be in the house all the time, right? right? You know, because <laughs> a little bit of both. Because I right. have a number of parents right now paying for my services to help their new grads, really what I'm seeing with COVID is, is the young folks um, who don't have a lot of experience, right? To back it up. If you have a, if you have a big net, if you've been around a long time, you have a big network. You know? Why did you choose the mid to late career market? So the funny thing is I didn't choose it at all. It, it found me. Um, when I first started my business, I think I was like a lot of business owners and a lot of coaches, and I would literally sign up anyone who would pay me. Really, mm -hmm. I would. I mean, that's kind of what you do. You don't know what your niche is. You don't have a lot of confidence. You don't have a lot of experience. So uh, I didn't really know who I was going to be the best at serving. So, and plus, I just wanted to start, you know, making money and being financially secure. So I just enrolled wherever I could. But what happened was um, about six, I, I keep kind of track a little bit of my business in terms of, you know, the general age group, male, female, unemployed. I've always kept some stats because I've always been curious who I'm helping. Yeah. Um, and about six months into uh, my business, I took a hard look at who was reaching out to me and I evaluated it. And I said, oh my goodness, it's the 50 plus crowd. That's who's consistently reaching out to me. I didn't yeah. do it on purpose. I feel like my niche found me very much so. And so when I learned that, I, I just embraced it. And I started kind of, you know, doubling down on that because that seemed to be a group that really needed to be served. That's who was reaching out to me. And it makes a lot of sense because there certainly are barriers in the job search at that age. And I think that, um, it's very normal for people who are about mid-career, 45 years old, to really stop and reevaluate yeah. what do they want the second half of their career to look like. Um, so it's, right. it's kind of like that mid-career crisis <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's very real. Uh, so I just embraced it. I thought, that's fascinating. This is obviously a group that needs my help. And maybe it makes sense to, that me as a, mil a millennial, I guess I think I technically am an old millennial, um, you know, they see, may, might see my youth as an advantage as somebody who can help modernize their approach and help them to look more techno technologically savvy or modern on LinkedIn. So I think it really makes a lot of sense. So I just, my niche found me and I embraced it. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> so in this day and age, a lot of people are being laid off. Mm -hmm. Um, what can a, what what can a layoff do to a person emotionally spiritually mentally and even physically wow well i can tell you from personal experience yeah i i've been through five i think five or six uh, or actually wow. no yeah i think five or six um layoffs or separations in about seven years wow. in my 20s um one you know was the firing but then the rest were all just acquisitions, buyouts, that that's kind of what happens when you're in like the tech industry and things sure. like that. Sure. So I've been through that a lot. Um, it, it, here's the thing. It does whatever you allow it to do, right? This is how everything is in life. Um, you can, it, it's all about what you make it mean. You can make it a layoff mean that um, you're not valuable. You're going to have a hard time getting hired. How yeah. are you going to explain this to your next employer? Um, you know, you can make it mean all these negative things. And I, I understand that mindset because I've been there. So I know how tempting it is for people to go to that place. And I sympathize with that. But it, what I was able to do was really detach from a lot of that. And I, I was managed to always keep myself in a positive place because I knew when I was laid off, it wasn't about me. I knew I had value. I knew I had skills. And there was somebody out there who was yeah. going to hire me. And that mindset drove my success. 
despite all of those layoffs that I had, I remember the longest period I've ever had of unemployment was only five weeks. And I wow. truly believe that that is because of what I chose to make those experiences mean and how I chose to take action, massive action. I never um, took a break in between jobs and took yeah. time off. If, if a break happened and I had time off, great, but I kept job searching. I immediately would start job searching. I took action mm. right away and I took it from a very positive frame of mind because people can take action from a very negative and fearful place or out of obligation because they have to. And I think that person is going to get very different results than the person who takes action from a very positive and hopeful place saying, I'm happy to be doing this because I'm going to find that next great opportunity versus I hate job searching. This sucks. Why did they have to lay me off? How long is it? Am I going to have to go through this process? I don't know who's going to hire me. You know, we can go to that place if we want, but our results will reflect it. So mm. That was the reason for my success. I know that because I can put myself back in that frame of mind and, and remember what I thought. And there were moments, believe me, where I had frustration. It's not like it was all just sunshine and roses. There were definitely moments of frustration at rejections and, and how it felt like it was taking a long time. And I can't believe I'm in this situation again. I was just job searching last year. You know, yeah, I know yeah. all of those things, but you have to master your mindset. So what can it do to a person? It's up to you, right? It can put you into despair and affect your health and your mindset and your family relationships, or you can make something positive out of it. And it's not always easy to do, but that is what separates the people who are successful and get employed again quickly and the people who don't. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So given what you just said, what do you, what percentage of job search or career change is, is mental and emotional versus mechanical, the updating of a resume, the actual process of searching, reaching out to contacts, things like that? Mm. Yeah, it's not what people think for sure. Um, it's it, yeah. the vast majority of it, in my opinion, is it truly is mental. And the reason that I say that is because I, if you're not in a mental, positive mental and emotional state, if you're not prepared to do this search and the work that will be involved, and there will be work, um, if you're resenting the whole process, you're not even going to be open to what I have to say to coach you through those mechanical aspects, right? Mm -hmm. And this is absolutely evidenced in um, one of the young folks that I'm coaching just recently. She's an active client right now. And um, there's just a lot of self-confidence that we have to overcome, kind of some negative limiting self-beliefs in there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I have to work through that first with her because this is not really hearing the other stuff, right? So right, right. <laughs> that is the majority of it. it. It's over half of it. If I had to put a number on to 60, 70%. That is the first step. You've got to be in a headspace and emotionally yeah. to do this process because it can be difficult, right? There's going yeah. to be perceived rejections, right? There's going to be work involved. There's going to be outreach. And you're, a lot of people don't think this. They come to me and say, oh, I need a resume update. Oh, I need my LinkedIn profile. Right. And, and right. yes, we'll do that. We'll do that. But first, <laughs> I want to know more about what are your expectations for this job search? What is your mindset? Do you have time set aside for this? What is your outlook on this whole process? You know, so there's sure. a, a lot of things that we have to go through first. Now, some clients come to me in a great spot. Absolutely. They're like, yep, yeah. I'm ready to take action. I'm motivated. Let's do this. Awesome. Let's go right to the job search process. Yeah, yeah. But then there are some folks who are like, I don't know if people are going to hire me. I don't know. I don't want to call that person. I don't want to put myself out there or oh, I don't really have right. time for this. You know, there's a lot of yeah. that and that's mental and emotional barriers, whether they wow. recognize it or not. So um, sometimes people come to me for one thing and they end up getting another, right? <laughs> they get coached on something <laughs> right. that they would, because I will have to stop clients and say, so I, I feel like we need to go, go there in this direction. I know you asked me this, but based on what you're sharing with me, here's where, where I want to take the coaching. Um, here's what I think you, you might need at this moment if you're open to that. Sometimes I have to stop and change the direction of it because I see what they need and they don't. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge as a coach. That's a challenge sometimes because yeah. 
they think they need one thing and you know they need another and you have to make them see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what kind of work do they have to do on their end to, to go from despair to hopeful? I think they need to figure out where that despair is coming from, right? So life is about uh, what we make it mean, you know, in our association. So somebody maybe has learned to associate the job search process with pain and hard yeah. work and negativity and rejection. And this is this just sucks. I hate this process. No one likes this, right? Those are the kinds of things that people say. Um, so you have to figure out, well, where did you learn to think that way? Why mm -hmm. do you think it has to be like that? Where did this despair come from? Because it's only going to really be painful if you make it painful, but you learned to think that way from somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So I, I ask a lot of questions about why, you know, why does this have to be hard? Why does this have to be difficult? Why does it have to take a long time? You know, why do you feel like you won't get hired? Why do you think somebody's going to turn you down just because you're 50, right? Where did that come from? Right. You know, we, yeah. we have to question our own beliefs and ask ourselves if they're serving us. And, and if that's really what we believe and what we know to be true as a fact, or if it's something we adopted and kind of like absorbed from other people, social media, society, we, we absorb all of these other thoughts and beliefs and we buy into them and they were never really our beliefs to begin with. Right? Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. So I have to challenge those beliefs with people, especially the age thing is a big one. Because sure. yes, age discrimination does happen. Let's not say that it doesn't, hmm. but I think we go looking for it where it doesn't exist sometimes and, and maybe other kinds of discriminations because they'll say, oh, I didn't get that job. They, they didn't hire me because I'm old and I have gray hair. Believe me, I hear that all the time. And, yeah. and I say, really? Do you, how do you know? <laughs> like, do you know that for a fact? Maybe, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. And it doesn't really matter. You're going to have to push through that. You're, nothing changes the fact that you're 50 and have gray hair, right? And you still need a job. What, yeah. Yeah. what are you going to do? Like push through it. <laughs> does it, does it yeah. really matter? No. <laughs> so I, I have to work with people to kind of challenge that belief. And it, so it's about, to answer your question, it's about asking yourself where your beliefs come from mm. and are they really your beliefs and facts? And do you want to keep believing it going forward? Is it going to help your cause to keep believing it going forward? That's incredible. That's, that, mm. that's, an, that's an incredible response because what I hear you saying is that, that job search or career change or anything that we're doing that, that would create value for, for a company or an organization, that this whole process is not just the mechanics of, of a resume or a LinkedIn profile, that there's, that really it's about, it really does come down to belief and, and that, mm -hmm. uh, that the majority of it comes down to what you believe. And that is actually what's going to manifest in, in reality. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. incredible. That's incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm living proof of that. This is just things that I've learned, right? Because from my own experience, I, like I said, I remember being in my twenties and being laid off for the first time. And I truly thought to myself, whoever gets me next is going to be lucky. I really believe, and it wasn't big headed. It was just that right. I believed in myself. I yep. knew I was like, I'm a good employee. I show up, I work hard. I do more than the minimum. Mm. I look at these things as facts about myself. And that drove my actions. So I, even though it was exhausting sometimes, yeah. I had this positive mindset while I was applying for jobs. And it really helped me to manage the so-called rejections and things like sure. that and push through them and keep going. And I truly believe that that is why I was always able to uh, get employed again so quickly. Yeah. How did you develop that confidence in yourself? Because that takes some work. It does. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, it, on one hand, I want to say I, confidence I've developed over time, but more than anything, I, what I have learned, and I, I did it on my own podcast, I did a show uh, all yeah. about confidence, mm -hmm. because what I have learned is that confidence is a choice. It is just nothing more mm. than a conscious choice. Wow. It is available to every one of us at every second of the day in every opportunity, every situation. You can be confident at any moment. I've learned this, mm -hmm. that if anyone displays more confidence in life than you, they're choosing to be confident. 
because I could choose to be not confident in, in anything, you know, in, and I could choose to be nervous, have anxiety, not believe in myself. So I've, it's funny. On one hand, it's developed over time through life experience, which I think is normal for a lot of people. We do in some way, some ways tend to get more confident as we get older. Right. Yeah. But more than anything, I've just learned that I, I can make a choice no matter what is going on around me. Mm. I can choose to be confident in myself or not. It's, it's a choice. Like everything else, every emotion we experience is a choice. It, whether we realize it or not, emotions are conscious choices. Wow. So um, that's, that's really where it comes from. I think ever since I was young, though, I've always been very um, spiritually focused and very aware and mm. personal growth and personal development is just something that was fostered in me from my parents from the very beginning. It's just, I'm blessed in that way. It's something I've always um, valued uh, and, and developed and, and, and even very you, much yeah. so in college. I was very much aware and my spiritual beliefs were really important to me mm -hmm. and that has only grown and that's been my foundation for, for everything, including my confidence. Right now we're in cataclysmic economic times and we've seen unprecedented unemployment, you know, ever since the great depression and, and by, and by numbers, just it's, it's even greater than, than it was back then. So how does a person find a job? during during times like this mm -hmm. is it any different than than times of prosperity you know it's funny how i i think it is and it isn't right we when we go through something like this we have to kind of remind ourselves yes a lot of aspects of what we are going through right now are unprecedented but they're kind of not, you know, when you look at history, I mean, we've been through, like you said, the Great Depression. We've been through recessions before. As a species, we have been through so much. We've been through 9-11. We've been through all the world wars. And we're here. We're still here, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to get through this just like we've gotten through everything else in history. But I think that we forget that sometimes, especially yeah. if it wasn't in our own lifetime. Right? If, right, because I didn't personally experience, you know, Vietnam and all those things, but I can only imagine the world must have changed as towards as a result. Right, I did live through 9/11. I know that the world changed as a result of that, and we're going to be okay. So we're going to get through this. We don't know how long it's going to take or what it's going to look like, but absolutely, the process very much is still the same. And I think, if anything, m more than ever now what we were just saying about mindset is going to be even more important. That has never been more important than now. It's easy to have a good mindset when things are rosy, right? When the economy is up and, you know, yeah. unemployment is down and things like that. So this is truly an opportunity for us to test what we know, to test our faith and test our resolve mm. and fall back on those principles that we know to be true. Uh, so it's, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? So right, now's the right. time to put into action everything that you say that you believe and that you know to be true. So it, in a way, it's the same as what we've always done. It's just mm. everything I think is emotionally intensified right now. You know, it's, it feels a little bit intense, but um, we're going to get through it. I, I hear what you're saying about, about things being, you know, emotionally intensified, but that the process is, is still effectively the same and, yeah. and what we think regardless it, it still translates even more so now than ever. Is a successful job search or career change, is it highly targeted or is it just simply a numbers game? The more I put out there, the, the higher the probability. What's your thought on that? Oh no, it's, it's, it's going to be targeted. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if, if you think about it, it's not that different than sales, right? So anybody who sure. is in marketing or sales, will tell you that you need to know who your customer and who your audience is, right? That's who you want to target, who is potentially going to buy your product. So you do market research to find out, okay, who's mm -hmm. potentially going to buy my product? What are they interested in? What are their problems that I need to solve? And then you target a campaign, a marketing or sales campaign around that rather than just kind of shooting it all out there, <laughs> you know, yeah. shooting an app thoughtlessly out there and hoping somebody clicks on it, right? It, it, that right. would be the kiss of death in marketing. I don't think there's anybody in marketing who would recommend that you just shoot, spend money and shoot it out there and see who buys it, right? That would really work. So if that doesn't work, 
in marketing, why would that work for you now in a job search campaign? The, mm -hmm. the callback rate on applying online strictly is less than 5%, most people believe. Not to say it couldn't work. I have gotten jobs in my youth, you know, in my early 20s, just by applying online. It's happened to my husband, but it's also happened that he's gotten really good jobs by referrals and people who he, he knows. So um, what I tell people, I take kind of a balanced approach. I say, you know, the job boards aren't bad. It's okay to mm -hmm. apply to a job every now and then on, on a job board, but don't yeah. make that your only strategy. Don't make that your primary or only thing that you are doing. You need a healthy mm -hmm. mix of talking to people, sending your resume out, engaging with people who know you and could possibly recommend you or right. work at the company that you are interested in. But that's a scary process for people who've never done it and, and don't have maybe some confidence um, right. yeah. and are accustomed to just shooting resumes off blindly online behind their computer. It, it, it gives kind of the illusion of productivity because you feel like you got a lot done. Yay, I applied to 20 jobs today, right? But probably none or maybe one are gonna call you back. Right. <laughs> so right. it's about taking um, more of an approach of not just being productive, but being effective, mm. yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How important is a person's network in this process? It's very, oh, it's very important. Absolutely. Um, but I, I have to convince people of that a lot. I think that, um, and, and I don't want to make too much of a generalization, but I do think the younger generation, it is a, it's a little harder. Uh, you know, I would probably have to coach some of them a little bit more on that because they're accustomed to having a lot of like connections on social media, but how right. well those people really know you, right? How deep are some of those relationships? Whereas I do see that not always, but as a, as a whole, the older generation has that larger network and they have mm -hmm. people who, who know them and they've really built those relationships. So I don't want to draw that conclusion too much, but I, I as a whole, I do see a little bit of that. Um, yeah. It's very important. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, people still get people jobs. There's still a person doing the hiring behind that online posting that you see. So th right. that has not changed even with technology. I don't think that's changed yet. Mm. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the ways that people can sort of give themselves a, a little bit of an edge. Um, I'm curious to know what you think about the, like premium services. Like if, if you were to go, if you were to do like LinkedIn premium or, 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 or even hiring like a headhunter or, you know, or, or even a career coach like yourself, you know, what kind of, what kind of edge, does that give you um, over, over another person? Just like, well, that's a great question. So just like anything else, I think it's what you make of it, right? So a lot of people ask me, oh, should I sign up for LinkedIn premium? Yeah. And I say, well, are you going to use it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if you're going to educate right. yourself on what all the benefits are and make LinkedIn a strategic part of your job search and use the benefits that come with it, yeah. absolutely. Yes, it can help you. Is it necessary for every person? No, it's one of those things, just like hiring a career coach, you can't just sign up for it and then not change anything and not take full advantage of it. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with what you've signed up for. So, cause I could have somebody sign up for my services, but then not really do what I'm suggesting or not be open to everything and not really change their, their habits and their um, approach. But luckily most people who come to a career coach are prepared to do that. So that's a good yeah. thing. That's why they came to a coach in the first place. But like yeah. anything, I think those things absolutely have value, but you, it's what you make of it. You, you can't just sign up for it and then not take advantage of it. You, you still have to take action. Nothing replaces taking action. Yeah. What about like headhunters, like, you know, at, at, at the, at the higher levels, at executive levels, uh, or even not, you know, it, does that give you any decided advantage, you know, for those who can afford to, to use them? Yeah, I think it can at that level. I think if you're at the executive level, it, mm -hmm. it can make a lot of sense because the executive job search is, can take they anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Sometimes that can be the higher up you go, the less positions oh. there are, right? It's kind of like a pyramid. Um, wow. And so wow. it's more, I think that it makes more sense at that level, yeah, to invest in some help. And that's a way for you to kind of broaden your network because now you have their network of folks as well that they can connect you to a lot of hidden job opportunities that might be available not online, but through um, 
through no. a staffing agency or a headhunter, right? You don't really see a whole lot of, you know, CEOs advertised on indeed.com and things like that. Yeah. Those yeah. Are often in the hidden job market. So yeah, I think those people, it can make sense to make that investment. Yeah. And, and, and you, you just said something that I want to pull the string on a little bit. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the hidden job market. What, what do you see, you know, what's the percentage roughly about, you know, between what's advertised versus what's not advertised? So that's a good question. There's a, it's, no one knows for sure. There's a <laughs> lot of numbers yeah. thrown out there. Sure. I've seen everything from 90% of jobs are hidden, 50% of jobs are hidden. I mean, a lot of people think that the, that number is inflated when you hear 80, right. 90% of the job market is hidden. I think that probably is inflated, but yeah. I would feel comfortable saying probably at least half of it is, wow. is hidden. I mean, a good part of it, but no one knows for sure, right? We're all throwing numbers out there. If it's hidden, how can we measure it? Sure. <laughs> right? sure. yeah. we, don't, we don't really know for sure, but we do know <laughs> yeah. that there are a lot of jobs out there that are not advertised for a lot of reasons, right? If you think about it, a company is going to want to first, they might open it up internally first, then they might open it up to um, referrals and see if they can get a referral mm -hmm. before. Sure from a, uh, an employee. Um, they might use a staffing agency. And if that's the case, they're probably not going to post it online because the staffing agency wants you to come through them so they can get their commission. So right. there's a number of reasons why you may not see it online right away. It may have, by the time it makes it online, it may have been open for a couple of months. That might be their last resort. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Different companies take different approaches, but I definitely think, like I said, the, the higher up you go in your career, the more likely your jobs are going to be in the hidden job market. Um, you know, things like that are more hourly, um, you know, working at a restaurant or retail store, that's going to be online. That's going to be online. And that's a generalization. I'm making a generalization, but that is sure. generally the case um, because a lot more you know, once you get up to the higher level and higher salary, higher responsibility, they're going to really want to put a lot of thought and attention to who they hire and they're going to want referrals. And it's going to be Absolutely. expensive if they make the wrong hire Absolutely. at that point. So there's going to take a different approach. Yeah. What advice do you have for people who are changing jobs or careers in this new environment? What advice would you offer them? You know, for example, how to conduct themselves on Zoom calls and things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that it depends on the person, but sure, if you're not, I would say, say if you're not comfortable with technology and Zoom calls, get comfortable with it. Practice with a family member, pra you know, do a Zoom call with a friend or a family and have them give you feedback on things like your lighting and your posture and your eye contact, mm -hmm. uh, your tone of voice, all those things that, that are so important in that first impression. So yeah, little nitty gritty things like that. Absolutely. You know, the things are going online, onboarding, interviews. It was already going in that direction, but now it's like right. accelerated in that direction. But, um, I, but I would also say it's, it's a lot of the same things. You're just going to have to push through and be persistent. Things are slower right now. So mm -hmm. you need to manage your expectations that hiring processes are taking longer. They, they really are. And that's okay. So don't assume that just because you didn't get a call back in two or three weeks even doesn't mean that you won't. So I think we all have to slow down, manage our expectations. Things are moving a little bit slower, although I think now they're starting to pick up. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, I think that that's really just the most important thing right now is that understand that you're trying to get hired in a pandemic. It can happen, and it's happened to many of my clients, but right. be patient, right? Be patient and be persistent. Yeah. If you could give one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Oh, wow. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah. Um, I would say follow your curiosity. Follow your curiosity instead of your passion. So, and the reason I say that is I received um, some really an awareness and wonderful advice through my favorite author, Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she was giving a talk um, where she said she used to be what she calls a passion bully, right? So she used to always tell people that trite advice of follow your passion. That's how you should find the meaning of your life or the right career, right? Follow right. your passion. We hear right. that a lot. Yes. But I think yes. A lot of people get disillusioned by that because they don't know what that is. And then they feel like a loser, right? Because right. Like, why, why right. I guess I don't have one, right? 
so she was giving a talk and she said, um, I don't say that anymore. Now I realize you just need to follow your curiosity. What are you interested in? What is fascinating to you? What do you want to know more about? And just be open and be curious yeah. in the world, like a child almost. And that just might lead you to your passion. But, it's, but we put over emphasis on having this one set path and this one passion, and that's just what you got to do with your life, right? And come away from that and just have a mindset of curiosity. And that, when I really think about that, that's what got me where I am today because I had the boldness to say, well, I wonder what would happen if I started my own business. Would people sign up? Would I enjoy it? Would I be good at it? That's curiosity. Yeah. I followed my curiosity to see if that was going to be my passion, right? And it turns out that it was. And if it hadn't been, that's okay. I think, but I think that emphasizing curiosity over passion is so much more productive and more freeing. Mm -hmm. And so that's my advice to the world. How do you intend to leave the world better than you found it? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I'm, my intention is to do that through my coaching. That's a way of serving to me. I feel like that's my way of, my chosen way to serve the world is to help people enjoy their work better, um, be, be better at it, and um, find, find meaning in it when they want to. Mm -hmm. And um, so I feel that if I'm able to do that, well, I'm, then I'm helping them go out and show up in the world in a better way. And it's, it's a ripple effect, right? So I'm using my talents for something that I love, which is helping them to use their talents for something that they love. And if more and more and more people start doing this, it's just exponential. So I feel that my calling is, is to do that, but that's my way of serving the world is to be a career coach. I know it sounds super cheesy, but right. it's true, right? right? It does. It sounds like a Hallmark card, but really that's what I feel is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And, and we all serve in a certain way. This is just mine. Somebody else's mm -hmm. might look better, but um, you know, with every client I enroll, my intention is leave them better than I found them, mm -hmm. help them in some way, yeah. you know, and what that is and to what degree it varies between the client. But I always want to enroll people who I feel like I can leave them in, in a better condition than I found them. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that I haven't asked you um, that you think would be helpful for us to know? Oh, um, I don't know. I think that, um, I guess just for, the, for what we're going through yeah. right now, I just would really urge people to to really make the use of this time in this pandemic and, and look past the media, mm -hmm. look past the negativity and look for the good and beautiful things that are happening right now, yeah. because they are, there are so many opportunities. I really truly feel like the world is going through an awakening right now, it, a spiritual awakening. I do. And I, I think that it's all for a greater purpose. These are just my beliefs, but I, um, I think it's all for a greater purpose. And in the end, it, the world will be left better than it was when this, when this all passes. Uh, but we have to choose to see that, right? We have to choose to make something good out of this. So that's my intention is to be a part of the solution with this, with, you know, economically and um, spiritually and emotionally, I'm trying to show up in the best way I can make the best of the situation and help other people to stay positive and push through this and realize that humanity has been through uncertainty before. We've been through challenges. We've been through crisis, even worse ones than this. Truly, yeah. we have, and we've survived and we've persevered. So there is no reason to believe that we will not get through this pandemic and, and, and potentially even come out better than we were before. So that's, that's what's on my mind these days. <laughs> well, I, I think that the world needs more people like you, Lorraine. And, oh, thank uh, you. And blessings on you and, and thank you for, for taking time out of your busy life to spend uh, an hour or so with, with me and, and with uh, our audience and, and for sharing everything that you shared. It's, it's gold what you shared today. Oh, and, you. Um, and I'm very, very grateful uh, to you for your time. And I look forward to seeing all the great things that you're going to be doing. I have a feeling you're gonna be very busy going forward. <laughs> um, just just with, the, with your approach, with, with your, the way that you think uh, you know, that you, mm -hmm. you've got, you've got a lot of things on straight, I think. Well, thank you. So, thank you. Um, 
Thanks for having me. I, I'm a fan of your show. I, honestly, oh, thank I, you. so thank you. This is a great platform to, for me to be on. I think we have a lot of similarity and similar thinking and things like that. Thank so I'm, I'm just honored to be a part of the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where can people find you online? Um, my website is careeruprising.com. Uh, but I also have the biggest presence on LinkedIn in terms of social media. So and people would be welcome to find me. Just Lorraine Rise. I'm pretty sure I'm the only Lorraine Rise on there that I know of. And so I'm pretty easy to find <laughs> with that last name. Um, but yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn group that I recently started. So that's a great place to join my community and interact with me and get help for free. So join me, they can join my LinkedIn group, awesome. um, join my email list at careerprising.com. Any of those would be great. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Lorraine. It was such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you.